afternoon, everybody. A, a pleasure to uh, greet you. I'm in Hamilton, Ontario, a beautiful sunny day here, cold sunny day. Uh, and I uh, want to welcome you to the to this series, which I expect will be a very uh, interesting and helpful series to understand the uh, the recent encyclical, most recent encyclical of uh, Pope Francis, Fratelli Tutti. And uh, I want to congratulate and thank uh, Mark Shea and Michelle Dabrowski for for organizing and coordinating this gathering. It's a uh, it's and and really I'm grateful to the uh, to the executive and the permanent council of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops for approving it so quickly and uh, uh, so soon so that we can understand uh, this uh, beautiful uh, this beautiful encyclical. So a little prayer at the beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, on our earthly pilgrimage in the footsteps of Jesus, your Son. You graciously call us to work together for the well-being of your church and the salvation of the world. Send forth your Holy Spirit upon us who gather in your name, that we may share our insights with honesty, openness, and mutual respect. Enlighten our minds and guide our reflections, decisions, and actions so that we may carry out your will in all things and grow together in faithfulness to the gospel guided always by your great commandment to love, to Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Crosby. Um, so let us begin. Our first speaker, Monsignor Murray Crutch, is a native of Kitchener, Ontario, and was ordained a priest in 1978, following studies at St. Peter's Seminary in London. In addition to serving in several parishes in the Diocese of Hamilton, he served for four years as a director of the National Office for Liturgy from 1986 to 1990. From 1981 until 2013, he served as director of liturgy for Hamilton Diocese. Monsignor Kretsch holds a master's degree in liturgical studies from the University of Notre Dame, Indiana, and has completed studies in ecclesiology and canon law. Over the years, he has served on several consultative bodies of the CCCB and the ACBO. Currently, he serves as Vicar General and the Chancellor in the Diocese of Hamilton. Please welcome Monsignor Murray Kretsch. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. First of all, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Mark Shea Lawrence and the National Office for Evangelization and Catechesis for the invitation to be part of this webinar on Pope Francis Fratelli Tutti. This latest magisterial teaching of Pope Francis is at once challenging and inspiring, and it's filled with so much wisdom. And so it really requires a careful reading and serious reflection as we look at our own respective roles in building fraternity and social friendship. Inspired by the counsels of St. Francis of Assisi, who he calls the saint of fraternal love, and who modeled in his own life the truth that love knows no bounds and transcends differences of origin, nationality, culture, and religion, Pope Francis has promulgated this encyclical in an attempt to foster fraternity and social friendship. It should be noted that the encyclical is addressed not only to Christians. He writes obviously from a Christian vantage point, but it is addressed to all people. And as the Holy Father says, it can serve as a primer to stimulate further thought on fraternity and social friendship and further initiatives to establish healthy human relationships. In my remarks today, I've been asked to provide an overview of chapter one, the introductory chapter to the encyclical, and then to propose some ways that we as catechists can apply the insights of our Holy Father to our ministry and thereby bring hope to those with whom we minister. Hopefully my observations will stimulate your own thinking and your own response to the Holy Father's call to build fraternity and social friendship. 
So let's dive into chapter one. In calling the Second Vatican Council, which took place between 1962 and 65, his predecessor, Pope St. John XXIII, urged the Church to read the signs of the times, to be attentive to the events and the currents of thought in the world around us, and to learn from them how we can bear witness to our faith in the present circumstances in which we live. In the spirit of the Council, Pope Francis begins this encyclical by doing just that. He provides for us an analysis of the signs of our times and proposes a path that we must walk as Christians, the path of fraternity and social friendship. I have to say that the title of chapter one, Dark Clouds Over a Closed World, doesn't sound very hopeful. Nevertheless, Pope Francis' reflections on the seven dark clouds that he identifies and the response that he proposes to each gives us some reason for hope that through our ministry, we can lift these dark clouds and bring hope to those with whom we minister. And so in the first chapter, next slide. In this first section of chapter one, Holy Father, considering Europe and Latin America in particular, draws our attention to a dream for a united Europe, which emerged following wars and disasters of recent memory. The dream of a concerted effort to work together to bridge, build, to bridge divisions and foster peace and fellowship among peoples of this continent. He also draws our attention to a similar dream for integration in Latin America, a dream of nations on that continent working together. These dreams are built on goodwill, on love, justice, and solidarity. However, with the passage of time and succeeding generations, it has become clear that not everyone continues to be inspired by this dream or by the same dream. It is also obvious that not everyone is committed to realizing such a dream. It's a huge dream. And such a dream cannot be realized in a matter of days or a few short years or with the efforts of only a few. It's a dream that requires the constant engagement of all parties and each succeeding generation. Regrettably, as the Holy Father points out, the dream has been eclipsed by complacency and selfishness fueled by various forms of nationalism and ideologies. Pope Francis notes that we are increasingly a global community. Certainly it is true that with developments in social media, we are more aware than ever of our brothers and sisters around the world. However, globalization has been used by the economic and financial sectors to create a single cultural model, which promotes individual interests and weakens the communitarian dimension of life. You'll say more about that later. I think that one of the most troubling signs of the times that the Holy Father notes in this section of the encyclical is the end of historical consciousness, which particularly affects young people. The focus on the present moment in isolation from the spiritual and human resources and the life lessons learned by past generations the Father, Holy Father notes, leads to reckless consumption and expressions of empty individualism and subjects people to new forms of colonialism. The lack of historical consciousness, he says, also empties words like democracy, freedom, justice, or unity of their meaning. And so as I reflect on this first cloud, it seems to me there are some significant challenges for all of us who are engaged in the work of evangelization and catechesis. But these challenges are also opportunities which will give hope to those with whom we minister. The humanitarian dreams, which Pope Francis says have been shattered, are not unrelated to God's dream for humanity, articulated so often in sacred scripture and the mission of Christ and his church. In fact, 
they are closely related. We were reminded in the opening words of the dogmatic constitution on the church from the Second Vatican Council, in Christ, the church is, and I'm quoting, a sacrament or sign and instrument of a very close union with God and the unity of the whole human race. So our present circumstances invite us first to proclaim afresh God's dream for humanity, the dream of life in God's kingdom announced by Christ, and to invite people to embrace it, to be part of making this dream come true in our own time. In these Lenten days, we are perhaps more conscious than ever of the gospel call to repentance and conversion, and the kind of commitment that's required in this effort. As Pope Francis rightly notes, the realization of any dream, be it the dream of humanity or God's dream for us, demands commitment and constant growth on the part of all. We can all become discouraged by shattered dreams, but the gospel is good news for us. It's a sure source of hope. I'm reminded of the beautiful passage from the Book of Lamentations, which often is proclaimed at funerals. After pondering his or her loss, disappointment and sorrow, the sacred author calls to mind, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Our present circumstances invite us to remember and to proclaim unceasingly that God walks with us. No need to be afraid or discouraged, as the Christmas and Easter Gospels powerfully assure us. The great task, and I would say the privilege, of the evangelizer and catechist is to help people connect the dots, to see the hand of God, God's daily mercies in their own lives and in the lives of others. When we find ourselves sharing ex such experiences, we truly find ourselves standing, I believe, on holy ground. Pope Francis remarks on the loss of historical consciousness, invite us to draw on the wisdom of our ancestors in faith. They may be the saints of old, they may be contemporary saints, or they may be what Pope Francis calls in his exhortation, Gaudete Exultate, the saints next door. We are invited to call on those, to draw on the wisdom of those folks, to share the stories of these saints with those who seek to know Christ and follow his way. As a Christian community, we have a wealth of accumulated wisdom to draw on as we proclaim the kerygma and accompany others as they learn to live the Christian life more fully each day. The fact that we have such an invaluable source at our disposal ought to give us catechists a spirit of confidence as we go about our ministry. The second dark cloud, which Pope Francis names, is lacking a plan for everyone. In this section of the encyclical, he begins by noting that in many places in our world, political leaders have for some time now been sowing seeds of division by their rhetoric and confrontational messages, which seek primarily to diminish the credibility of their opponents. Such math patterns of behavior turn our attention away from our neighbors and their needs, causing a major setback in the establishment of a united and just world. The Holy Father proposes a way forward out of this present state of things. Picking up on his message in Laudato Si, he recommends first of all, that we set aside our short-sightedness and instead set our sights on the world in which we live, the big world in which we live, recognizing that the earth is our common home and all earth's dwellers are members of a single body. Secondly, he urges us to direct our energies to caring for both our common home and for one another. This culture of care, which the Holy Father recommends, will embrace those 
who so often are currently disregarded, or as he says, discarded, the elderly, the poor, and racial minorities. The Holy Father urges us to abandon our present throwaway culture and embrace a culture of care. It is this culture which has the capacity to bear the fruits of unity and justice among all people. A major theme in this section of the encyclical is the insufficiency of universal human rights. Although for decades now, many nations around the world have publicly acknowledged the dignity of the human person and publicly stated their commitment to guarantee and protect the rights of everyone, the fact is there are still many instances where human dignity and people's rights continue to be violated. The Holy Father notes, and I'm quoting here, many forms of injustice persist, fed by a reductive anthropological vision and by a profit-based economic model that does not hesitate to exploit, discard, and even kill human beings, end quote. The evidence of this is to be found in present day forms of slavery, abuses against women and the unborn, trafficking of persons, unjust wages based on gender or race, the treatment of migrants, and wherever people are used as objects and means to an end. The lack of universal human rights only serves, he says, to isolate people, plunging them into loneliness, fear, and insecurity. As I reflect on this second dark cloud, it seems to me that there are three implications for all of us who are engaged in the work of evangelization and catechesis. In contrast to the kind of language that makes up so much of present day political discourse, language which is confrontational and disrespectful of others' points of view, the language of our faith proclamation catechesis must be dialogical, that is, composed of both respectful listening and what I would call an invitational proclamation. Evangelization and catechesis so closely related cannot simply be a matter of indoctrination or proselytizing, but a matter of honest and respectful dialogue. Given the Holy Father's call to replace the throwaway culture with a culture of care, it seems to me that an emphasis in our catechesis must clearly be on our care for the environment and our care for one another, especially the most vulnerable. Our care for our planet and for our neighbor must be seen as the defining characteristic consequences of our encounter with Jesus Christ. Without displacing the story of our salvation in Christ or God's revelation in sacred scripture, or the church's tradition, or the sacramental and prayer life of the church, the social teachings of the church must become even more prominent as an element of our catechetical ministry. It perhaps seems obvious, but I think that a third takeaway from this section of the encyclical is that our work of evangelization catechesis must be welcoming and respectful of all who come to us desiring to encounter Christ and to grow in their relationship with him. And we must look for meaningful ways to accompany them. Any of us who have been involved with the adult rites of Christian initiation know very well that one form of instruction does not fit all. I suspect it's true in the catechesis of children too. People come from different backgrounds and different experiences of life with different questions. We are also aware of different learning styles, for this can be a challenge, but I would also say it speaks of our vocation, our vocation to welcome others as they uniquely are. As a priest mentor of mine once told me long ago, welcome everyone, accept them where they are, and look for a way to help them take one step forward not a bad plan of action for an evangelizer or a catechist. The third dark cloud, which Pope Francis names, 
is globalization and progress without a shared roadmap. Drawing on his dialogue with the Grand Imam Ahmad al tayyab the Holy Father acknowledges that there have been many advances in technology, medicine, manufacturing, and welfare. And we are all very aware of these. However, the fruits of these advances, the resources produced, are not shared fairly throughout the world. We have become globalized in the sense that we have a knowledge of what is happening in every part of the world. For example, we know almost immediately when an earthquake or some other natural disaster strikes in even the most remote part of the world. Through a variety of media platforms, we are immediately in touch with the rest of the world. It seems we know what is happening everywhere. But as the Holy Father points out, while we may know about advances in technology and medicine, manufacturing and welfare, their fruits are not shared globally for the benefit of all. Some benefit, others do not. We may be thinking globally, but we are not acting globally as brothers and sisters, members of a single global family caring for one another. With only occasional exceptions, when a crisis takes place in another part of the world, we remain silent and inactive, leaving our brothers and sisters to fend for themselves. We fail to act. Pope Francis calls this globalized indifference, which results in a gap between concern for one's personal well being and the prosperity of the larger human family. This globalized indifference, he says, results in global isolation instead of global closeness. In light of this situation of global indifference, Pope Francis proposes that we can bring new hope to our world by developing a culture of encounter. This culture of encounter goes hand in hand with the culture of caring. And both of these cultures demand that we have a common purpose, which is the advancement of the common good, a collective response rather than an individual one, and a sustained response, not a sporadic or isolated response, by all who call this planet home. It seems to me that our Ministry of Evangelization Catechesis provides us with a wonderful opportunity to take some first steps to foster the culture of encounter and give hope to our brothers and sisters. Essentially, the goal of evangelization and catechesis is not the acquisition of a body of knowledge, but rather a personal encounter and an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church and wholehearted engagement in the church's mission. Throughout the process of Christian initiation, we have wonderful opportunities to model and to guide those who, with whom we minister, that they may have actual encounters with brothers and sisters in need, both locally and even internationally. For example, by actually participating in the corporal works of mercy collaboratively with other members of the community, hopefully leading to some form of ongoing ministry, we draw close we encounter our neighbors as brothers and sisters with whom we share a common home. The fourth dark cloud, which the Holy Father names, is the one that has touched each of our lives most recently in a very personal and immediate way. He speaks of the present pandemic, which has held the world in its vice-like grip. This present pandemic, he says, has revived the sense that we are a global community, that we are all in the same boat, where one person's problems are the problems of all. He repeats his assessment of the impact of the present pandemic, which he first articulated in his remarks during the extraordinary moment of prayer in the Vatican on March 27th of last year. And I quote, the storm has exposed our vulnerability and uncovered those false and superfluous certainties around which we, are, we constructed our daily lives, our projects, our habits, and priorities. 
Amid this storm, he says, the facade of those stereotypes with which we camouflaged our egos, always worrying about appearances, has fallen away, revealing once more the ineluctable and blessed awareness that we are part of one another, that we are brothers and sisters of one another. The pandemic, he says, has caused us to wake up to reality, to rethink our lifestyles and our relationships, the organization of our societies, and above all, the meaning of our existence. The Holy Father's concern is that when we get to the other side of this pandemic and return to normal, whatever that is, we might actually do just that, go back to the way we were, without holding on to the lessons we have learned, the ways we have come together for one another during this past year. He is fearful that we will plunge ourselves even more deeply into feverish consumerism and new forms of egoistic self-preservation. And so he calls us to see the present pandemic not just as one more tragedy in our human history, but rather as a call to conversion, to change of mind and heart, to a way of thinking no longer in terms of them and those, but only of us. Only such a conversion, he says, can lead us to recover the shared passion to create a community of belonging and solidarity worthy of our time, our energy, and our resources. An integral part of our ministry of evangelization and catechesis is conversion. Conversion, which is intellectual, which is religious, which is moral, and which is Christocentric. And so Pope Francis reflects on the present pandemic that it ought to resonate with us and our vocation in a special way. Evangelization and catechesis must always lead to the abandonment of one way of thinking and acting and the embrace of a new way of life, shared life in Christ. And so as evangelists and catechists, our vocation is not only to call others to conversion, but also to walk that path ourselves, to model the gospel call to conversion. As we do this, we offer hope to those who may be struggling to respond to the Lord's call, assuring them that they are not alone, and that conversion to the Christian way of life is both possible and life-giving. In the next uh, section of the chapter, Pope Francis speaks to us about the plight of mar migrants. Since the very beginning of his papacy, Pope Francis has drawn our attention to the plight of migrants. In this fifth section of the chapter, he names the treatment of migrants as one of the dark clouds overshadowing human solidarity. The Holy Father asserts that the rights of individuals, rather he insert, asserts the rights of individuals to dwell in peace in their respective homelands, but also their right to acquire safety and security in host countries based on their inherent dignity as human beings. But he reminds us of the exploitation that many vulnerable migrants experience as they seek refuge in a place where they expect to live in peace and security. All too frequently, he notes, they are victims of trafficking, psychological and physical abuse, and untold sufferings on the journey. And they even suffer from the effects of religious and cultural uprooting. Furthermore, Pope Francis draws our attention to the unfortunate reception that migrants experience in some host countries. The xenophobic mentality, often motivated by political interests, determines how migrants are treated in some of the receiving countries. They are considered less worthy, less important, less human. In the nutshell, their human dignity is neither respected nor safeguarded. The Holy Father states emphatically that such behavior is simply incompatible with our fundamental Christian belief in the inalienable dignity of each person, regardless of origin, race, or religion, and the supreme law of fraternal love. 
and he calls on us to restore the sense of responsibility for our brothers and sisters, on which every civil society is based, by drawing on our rich cultural and religious heritage, which has in the past defended the centrality of human persons. Without question, the Catholic Church has been in the forefront of respecting and safeguarding the dignity of every person, especially the most vulnerable. I think in particular of the important contribution through the centuries that our educational and healthcare institutions have made. I think too of the countless social services which have been provided by Catholic institutions, often inspired by the charisms of religious congregations, but carried out in collaboration with many of the lay faithful. And then there is also the moral teaching of the church, so well known, which steadfastly challenges the assaults on human life from conception to natural death. As I reflect on the experience of the migrants, as the Pope describes it, it seems to me there are some implications for our ministry of evangelization and catechesis. Obviously, as local Christian communities, we are called to provide hospitality and much needed supports to those who come to us, having fled their countries of origin. But in addition to providing welcome and support, it is important that we listen with respect to their stories and that we open ourselves to learn from their various cultures so that our handing on of the Christian faith can be received by them in a meaningful way, in a way that connects with their own lived experience of the sacred. This kind of listening is important, not only for migrants, of course, but for others who also receive our ministry. On many occasions, Pope Francis has described the church as a field hospital, where the Christian community provides a place of healing and restoration. In view of the suffering and injustices experienced by many migrants, and perhaps by, to a lesser degree by others who come to us eager to hear the good news and grow in faith, it seems to me that we ought to approach our ministry not only as one of proclamation or instruction or formation in discipleship, which of course it is, but also as a ministry of healing. The good news that we proclaim is news of forgiveness, mercy, reconciliation, and the healing action of Christ, which continues to be experienced in his church today. Through our ministry as catechists, we have the privilege of leading people to an encounter with Christ, who, as the hymn says, is the healer of our every ill. A third implication of our ministry, for our ministry, I believe, is the responsibility placed upon us to be clear, comprehensive, and consistent in articulating the fundamental Christian teaching on the inalienable dignity of every person. Such teaching cannot be limited to issues related to the beginning and the end of life, as important as those are, but must also include the many other ways that human dignity is violated in our world. The experience of migrants and the assaults on their, to their dignity provide an insight into at least some of the other ways that respect for human dignity is absent in our world. Other issues that we are called to address as a Christian community and as a global family, where all are to be treated as brothers and sisters. The sixth dark cloud that Pope Francis names is the illusion of communication. In this section of the encyclical, Pope Francis addresses the current phenomena of digital communication and focuses on some of the destructive elements of this growing and otherwise useful instrument of communication. He notes that the digital media provides a wealth of information, but often at the expense of people's privacy. Every aspect of people's lives becomes public. Those who are determined to sow the seeds of hatred and destruction have found this form of communication to be a very powerful instrument in uniting people in their own cause. Furthermore, digital communication has encouraged remarkable hostility, insults, abuse, defamation, and verbal violence destructive of others. The Pope points out, there is a lack of restraint in digital messaging that could never exist in physical contact without tearing us apart. 
The lack of immediate personal engagement in real time has led to what Pope Francis calls shameless aggression. Since people are increasingly not communicating in person, he says, and I'm quoting, they cannot take note of the physical gestures, facial expressions, moments of silence, body language, and even the smells, the trembling hands, the blushes and perspiration that speak to us and are part of human communication. The Holy Father points out that the negative effects of digital forms of communication have also had an impact on people of faith, on you and I. Even in the Catholic media, he says, limits can be overstepped, defamation and slander can become commonplace, and all ethical standards and respect for the good name of others can be abandoned. One of the consequences of this, these forms of communication is that each person can immediately choose what messages they like what messages they dislike, what they find attractive, what they find distasteful. Those they find attractive, they continue to keep in touch with. Those distasteful, deleted. Anything unpleasant or disagreeable is simply deleted in today's virtual networks, therefore isolating people from the real world in which we are living. The Holy Father urges us to counteract the negative effects of digital forms of communication by instead actively engaging in personal encounters, by listening to one another and thereby finding true wisdom. I believe that Pope Francis is right on the mark in his assessment of the negative aspects of our new and ever developing forms of communication. Many contemporary commentators have also noted that the iso noted the isolation and the lack of genuinely human encounters which have resulted with the compulsive use of social media devices and platforms. And as Pope Francis points out, this undermines our awareness of ourselves as brothers and sisters and impedes our commitment to build up the global family. In terms of our ministry as evangelists, it is clear to me that our principal task is to proclaim the gospel in personal encounters marked by respectful dialogue. Our task is to personally accompany those individuals in, who, de, who, desire, who have a desire for God, that that desire might be awakened. Those who are longing to encounter Christ in their lives, those who wish to participate more intentionally in his mission. Pope Francis' assessment of the impact of digital communication in our world offers us a valuable caution, I believe. We cannot rely on digital media to do the work of evangelization or catechesis, and certainly not at the expense of personal encounters and accompaniment. As many of you are aware, probably better than I, in recent years, there has been a seeming avalanche of podcasts, YouTube videos, and other digital resources produced as tools for promoting evangelization and rendering catechesis effective. No doubt, many are helpful. However, they're not all equal in quality, and some are motivated by ideological agendas. And they can never, of course, replace our personal proclamation and witness. And so an unchecked reliance on information from digital media outlets can, I believe, lead to what some commentators have called cafeteria Catholicism, the kind of Catholicism which is incomplete, or we might say slanted in one direction or the other. And that's the kind of Catholicism that separates rather than unites us as brothers and sisters within the church and in the global community. The final section of this chapter is entitled Forms of Subjection and of self-contempt. This final brief chapter, a brief section, I should say, Pope Francis draws our attention to contemporary forms of colonialism in which economically prosperous countries or even the affluent sectors of poor countries try to create a new culture in the service of the elite and at the expense of the poor and their self-esteem. The Holy Father insightfully states, quote, we cannot forget that there is no worse form of alienation than to feel uprooted and belonging to no one. 
unquote. The sense of belonging is foundational for the integration between generations and different communities and avoids all that makes us insensitive to others, which leads to further alienation. This short reflection by Pope Francis reminds me of the important role that the entire ecclesial community must play in the ministry of evangelization and catechesis. The ministry of catechesis is not the work of just a few individuals in the church, but it is the collaborative responsibility of all the baptized. The goal of our catechesis cannot be limited to fostering a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but must include fostering of a personal relationship with other members of the Christian community, which is the body of Christ. To be baptized into Christ is to be embraced and supported by the community, which is the body of Christ. An important goal for evangelization and catechesis then is to foster a culture of belonging. At the beginning of our rites of Christian initiation, we ask those seeking baptism or entry into full communion of the church to articulate their longing. What is it they're asking for? As I think of the many that I have accompanied in the journey of faith over the years, I can't count the number of times when people express their desire to be baptized or express their desire on behalf of their children by saying that they want, or they want their children to belong, to belong to this community. They want to belong. When I was a pastor, it was customary for us to meet during Easter week to review with the newly baptized their experience of the Easter Vigil. On many occasions, when I asked them about their first reception of the Eucharist, I heard them say, when I received the Eucharist for the first time, I knew that I finally belonged. They had been in church for weeks and months. They had been gathering with Christians for weeks and months, but now they belonged. To create an atmosphere of belonging, as the Holy Father says, is foundational for the establishment of fraternity and social friendship. And it's a task that falls to every catechist. It's a task that falls to us all. Just a couple of concluding remarks. In this first chapter of Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis seems to leave no stone unturned when it comes to naming the dark clouds that cover a closed world. Nevertheless, as he reads the signs of our times, he invites us to walk the path of hope. In particular, he points to our response to the current pandemic as a sign of hope. During this pandemic, we have witnessed so many acts of goodness and people throughout the world have come together to the aid of their brothers and sisters. He invites us to see our global response to the pandemic as a sign, a sign that God's dream for humanity, that we be united in our care for our common home and care for our brothers and sisters, can indeed become a reality. I would say that our experience of the pandemic gives us an opportunity to reset, to reset the ways that we think and act in relation to one another. Having witnessed the global response to the pandemic, we can get a glimpse of what God's dream for us looks like. And we know that it is possible for us to be united in our care for our common home and for one another. It is possible for us to create a culture of care, a culture of encounter, of accompaniment, and a culture of belonging. They're all needed for fraternity and social friendship. May we go forward from this moment in history, guided by Pope Francis, to strengthen those bonds of fraternity and social friendship. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monsignor Crutch. Uh, you've provided us with uh, a very insightful reflection on the context with, within which uh, Pope Francis uh, situates Fratelli Tutti. Uh, we might be daunted by these dark clouds, uh, particularly during this time of pandemic. However, we're encouraged by the signs of hope uh, that suggest we can and must become a culture of care. 
Thank you for helping us to reflect on the implications of Fratelli Tutti for our work. It is a crucial first chapter and you have given us great uh, food for thought. So thank you very much, Monsignor. So at this time, I'm going to um, uh, move to our responder, uh, who is Michelle uh, Dabrowski. So our next speaker, Michelle, was born and raised in Stratford, Ontario. Michelle is a PhD candidate at the Dominican University College, whose thesis is researching in the field of moral theology with a focus on bioethics and palliative care. She completed her undergraduate and master's programs in theology at the same university. Michelle has been involved in parish ministries such as building marriage preparation courses and she has served on parish pastoral councils. At the diocesan level, she served on the vocations committee for the French sector and spoke to the high school students on finding faith and meaning in their lives. In September of 2020 of this year, uh, she, uh, last year, she joined the Office for Evangelization and Catechesis at the CCCB as Research and Resource Development Assistant. In February 2021, she was appointed Director of the Office for Family and Life, a new office here at the CCCB. Michelle and her husband, Antoine, are the loving parents of a delightful baby boy, Florian, who just turned one year old. Michelle loves all things chocolate and reserves Saturday mornings for English Premier League soccer. Please welcome Michelle Dabrowski. Hello everyone. Glad to be with you and to be providing this um, response to the incredible um, opening we just had by Monsignor Murray Critch. I'm just going to get set up here. Wonderful. I'm also on the background technical side, so thank you for bearing with me. So what a wonderful way to launch this webinar series. Um, Monsignor Kretsch, you've set the stage, you oriented our reflection for the next four weeks. And so today in my, um, my brief response, I'd like to make the case that Fratelli Tutti is important for the catechist. And Monsignor Murray already really helped me with this. He had such a great reflection between summarizing chapter one and then also providing avenues for the catechist. So what a wonderful, reflection um, to help us along our way. So um, the, the thing that I will point to and try and add to our session um, is how, okay, so we were making the case that Fratelli Tutti is important for the catechist, but how do we consider also this in light of the new directory for catechesis? Uh, and so in this first session, my thought was to lay some foundations open up our reflection and offer some ideas that I see as being helpful for our webinar journey together. And I'm quite certain that the presentations that follow mine will bring further precisions and clarity. So today is really a starting point. And so I wanted to try and build a bridge or cast some lines between Fratelli Tutti and the role of the catechist, especially in light of um, the directory for catechesis. What are some basic things we can say to launch us into the coming weeks? And so I think that we as catechists, pastors, religious, religious ed educators, involved laypersons can, can read Fratelli Tutti and have it inform and even renew the way we read and implement the goals and tasks and insights that we find in this new directory for catechesis. Now, I'm not sure about you, but um, I felt that we have two mountains to climb. We have Fratelli Tutti and we have the directory for catechesis. Um, and so here we go together and I hope that we can um, lay some of that foundation work um, to begin this reflection. So for this series, um, we've placed Fratelli Tutti in dialogue with the directory. Um, and in preparing for today, when I went back to read certain parts of the directory for catechesis, I was struck by how I had different ideas and insights jump up from the page of the, the new directory with Fratelli Tutti in mind. And so it changed um, how I first approached the directory for catechesis last summer and over our webinar series in the fall. 
And so coming at it from another angle, um, it's helped me see the, the text with new light, new eyes. And my hope, our hope really is um, that it will be for you too. And so I think it's a wonderful exercise that we're doing. I'm slightly ambitious, but um, I think there's something to, to really do here and to unpack. Um, and at some points I was feeling like I was doing some, you know, mental gymnastics going back and forth, but um, I know, and we've already seen in this first uh, reflection that um, we are going to receive some deep insights and some ways forward together. So most of you, I'm sure, are already experts on the directory for catechesis, but for anyone joining in and hasn't had an opportunity yet to um, really explore this new um, publication, um, I wanted to give the directory for catechesis in 60 seconds, an overview. Um, and so a little bit of background. Um, the directory was released in 2020, so of last year, by the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization. And really it's a guide for the Christian faithful on how to proclaim the, go the gospel, how to proclaim it. Um, and so we see in the directory that it focuses on the goals and tasks of catechesis. So anybody involved with religious formation, Catholic education, um, is, it's uh, an important direct director for us. Um, and in the directory, it emphasizes the important relationship between evangelization and catechesis and the need for evangelization at all stages of life um, as we continue our ongoing catechetical formation. And it uses the term charismatic catechesis. So the need to, to present and re, um, reshare the, the basic charisma message and also um, continue our journey um, in, in solidifying our understanding of the faith. So quick overview, but we're going to go a little bit more into detail. I've, I've uh, pulled out some important parts for our reflection today. So the question I wanted to start with was, why is Fratelli Tutti important for the catechist? And then the first thing that came to mind, well, the catechist is concerned for his or her neighbor. Monsignor Kretsch offered a wonderful presentation to help launch us into the encyclical. And if I can summarize very briefly, Fratelli Tutti reminds us that we are part of a human community, a universal connection, which has its demands of justice, a call to compassion, fraternal love, and many other set of demands, because we are all part of this community. And so people of faith, we are called to respond to these demands, not in spite of our faith or our faith communities, but to be propelled to work for an increase of this social solid solidarity, attention to the poor and marginalized, the suffering with and through our faith communities. The demands of our common humanity strengthen the call to be part of the response. So the first idea is that Fratelli Tutti calls us not to run away or take another road or turn a blind eye to our social connections and relations. Fratelli Tutti says we are all part of the human community, which has its demands in terms of um, injustices, implications of political powers, digital communication, and globalization of cultures that's surrounding us. And so as individuals and communities of faith, we are called to actively respond to these demands because of our faith and not in spite of our faith. We simply cannot exclude these aspects of our existence of life in Christ. Social concern is central. So as catechists, we try to communicate the faith, share the charisma, and assist in this maturation of the relationship with Christ. Yet we also need to communicate the importance of social concern, or what is traditionally known as the social teachings of the church. This is also a central concern for catechesis. And today we will think about some ways of how we can con concretely do and think about this concern. And so the directory does speak about having eyes for injustices, um, where compassion is needed in our local settings and in the world. The directory speaks of these concrete areas as essential concerns. The directory speaks of these concrete areas like I said, of, of essential concerns. And so as catechists, we refine our communication of the gospel and pay particular attention to culture in a language that responds well and that doesn't compromise the content of faith. 
And so concern for our neighbor is a key part of the basic gospel message. This call must be realized concretely and the credibility of the gospel message relies on it. And so I raised um, a few basic points and they could, there, there, there are many others, but as a starting point today, um, I wanted to look at these areas. So I'll, I'll pick out um, some, some key points from the directory of catechesis that um, we see raising um, here. So the catechist, as I just, we just spoke a little bit about, is confirmed for his or her neighbor. The catechist is hopeful. The catechist discerns the signs of the times. The catechist is called to holiness. The catechist is called to do all of the above in community. And so today I would like to offer five areas for us to think about um, that to respond to this first question, why is fratelli tutti important for the catechist? And when we were looking at um, Fratelli Tutti, we thought, okay, does this document um, explicitly share a new, a, any information directly to the catechist? And catechesis um, comes up one time in Fratelli Tutti um, in, in a parag paragraph 86 there. Um, and it's, it arrives right at the end of chapter two. So I'm foreshadowing a little bit into next week. Um, but what we're being asked to do as catechists is to speak clearly about the social meaning of existence, the fraternal dimension of spirituality, the inalienable dignity of each person, and the reasons for loving and accepting all of our brothers and sisters. So as we walk through this series, I think we will all come to know more intricately um, what this means for us as catechists, but I just wanted to draw our attention um, that this document is, um, Fratelli Tutti is speaking to us as catechists. So firstly, I just wanted to, again, go through what I wanted to, to raise today. So hope, um, the, the title of this session was The Catechist Brings Hope. Um, and Fratelli Tutti is a hopeful document. Um, it leaves us with the sense that we can work towards hope, um, even when we face immeasurable challenges. So I wanted to speak a little bit about hope. And secondly, the call to discern the signs of the times. What does the directory say about discerning the signs of the times, as I think Pope Francis is doing in Fratelli Tutti? And thirdly, holiness. How do we make credible our message, looking at really the identity of the catechist that the directory also really uh, pays attention to. And then finally, a short note on the essential role of being a community of missionary disciples. So our starting point, what, what can we say? So this was another um, you know, area that came into mind. The catechist is hopeful. We are hopeful, a hopeful people. Um, hope is a natural virtue. Uh, we see this in, in the, the little quote here from Fratelli Tutti, that it speaks, hope speaks to something deeply rooted in every human heart. Um, and it opens us up to grand ideals that make life more beautiful and worthwhile. So hope is on every human heart and it helps unite us, helps us strive for beautiful things together. But hope is also a theological virtue. And hope in this sense is sustained through the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. So as catechists, we are bearers of this hope. And I think we have a responsibility to walk in the world with it. Walking with hope is a first way to engage in social friendship while also giving witness to our, to our faith. And I, and I find interesting too, and I, this is perhaps my own reflection, but I think hope allows us to build things, um, it, construct things, work towards the good. If, if hope is not there, then it, we, we fall into the, the area of meaninglessness. So hope leads us to the beautiful and towards truth. Hope is a powerful virtue. Um, and I think it's important to keep that central in our reflection. And so second, the second area that I wanted to raise in response was the catechist discerns the signs of the times. And so Pope Francis, um, from a universal viewpoint, shows us how to do this, how to do this discernment. And he does it from a universal point of view. Um, and he really, I think he does exemplify how to listen, how to see, how to take a pause and hear the echoes, sometimes the explosions or gentle hums in the directory for catechesis, reading the signs of the times is very important for the transmission of faith. 
um, we're asked to find ways to enculturate the faith. Reading the signs of the times is very important for doing that, that um, process of enculturation. And so we listen and learn from the universal insights provided from our church. And we seek to enculturate or bring down the faith into our local context, um, have eyes that see, ears that listen, and then we enter into the process of accompaniment um, and bringing the call, especially the social action call into concrete actions. Now I find it interesting um, at, when I was thinking about the signs of the times and where in the directory, well, in, in, in fact, the, the preface, the very reason for why we have a new directory for catechesis is exactly because after 20, after the first one, so of course that this, the directory for catechesis in 2020 um, is the third. And it's every about every 20 years um, since Vatican II, we have um, a new directory. And the reason we have a new one is because of a changed cultural, social, global context. Um, and it points to the directory for catechesis and, and the preface points to two phenomena. The first being digital culture, which brings along with it the second globalization of culture. And of course, these two um, are interconnected and they shape and they've really brought radical change and um, to the lives, my life, your life, and then the lives really of, of the whole planet. And so our new directory for catechesis is a fruit of this type of discernment of this signs of the times. And, and I think we're in turn invited to discern the signs of the times in our local settings, to have eyes in our local places. Um, and so in light of Fratelli Tutti, we, we come with that with particular attention to this call to compassion for our neighbor. And so I just will go quickly and, and show you where um, Signs of the Times appears um, in the directory and, and how and what it's pointing to. So in the introduction, um, we hear that when we do discern our times, listen to people, we open up for possibilities of encounter and for proclamation of the newness of faith. So, I, and I find this beautiful that the, the action of discernment, the deciphering the signs of the times and how we are going to transmit faith, the directory points out beautiful areas of how we are, we are doing that and how we're called to do that as catechists. The centrality of the believer in his or her life experience, that's something that's a, a nourishment from this doing this reading of the times. The considerable role in relationships and affections, interest in that which offers true meaning, and the rediscovery of that which is beautiful and lifts up the spirit. So there's, again, the process of how as catechists we're called to do this discerning of the times. In the second um, time we see signs of the times appearing in, in the new directory, um, it's in chapter one, and we hear about how the church looks at history with God's eyes. This idea of historical consciousness that Fratelli, Fratelli Tutti speaks about and that Monsignor Murray Critch spoke about earlier. That idea of really looking at um, history through God's own eyes and trying to decipher the actions of the Holy Spirit. And we are called um, to look actively with watchful discernment um, so that we can really um, to discern the presence and purpose of God. And I think it was Mons Monsignor Murray um, spoke about connecting the dots. So we, we're, we're seeing this on a universal level, the church doing the discernment. And then us as catechists, the idea to, in our own lives, how do we trace God's action in our lives as a, from a rereading, looking at where was God truly present and as a catechist, accompanying others do the same thing. So this is a posture of being discerning, thoughtful, um, and it's to pull us into the real challenges and experience of people and to discern where the Holy Spirit is active. And finally, so we don't see signs of the times um, until chapter 10, which is the uh, start of part three. Um, it's in the first paragraph of um, chapter 10. And we learn that discerning the signs of the times informs us, at, informs our catechesis. This posture refines us in what we do and how we do it. It's a call to grow an understanding and an attention with particular concern for cultural and social dimensions where we find ourselves. 
and in this quote, we look at how um, through through this discerning of signs of the times, um, we as as catechists participate in the ecclesial challenge to oppose process, um, forces of injustices, inclusion of the exclusion of the poor, primacy of money. Um, and, it, and it speaks there, that's where we see the idea of essential concern for catechesis. So in part three of the catechesis, um, that's where we, we have all of the particular ways that um, we can um, see different concrete settings. So um, that's where we see the bioethics, um, digital culture, um, ecumenism and interfaith conversations, um, all, the, all the questions on um, the inalienable dignity of the human person. So again, signs of the times as being um, an important quality for the catechist to grow. So we've looked at hope, the catechist as hopeful, and now the discerning the signs of the time. So the catechist who actively discerns to better enculturate the faith and to really have an eye and heart that sees where compassion is required. And I think the directory for catechesis also has an essential point that I would like to raise so that we can go one step further than only thinking about how we communicate the gospel message. But the preface of the directory, and later we see it, we'll see the same theme again in the identity of catechesis and the tasks of catechesis, informing for a life for Christ. It reminds us that the call to holiness is central to the role of the catechist. And in um, forming for a life for Christ under the tasks of catechesis, it cites Pope, um, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation on holiness in today's world, Gaudete Exultate. And I'll, get to, I'll read this in a moment, but I think it's um, pointing and I wanted to raise the question of being a catechist is not only about communicating the faith, it is about living the faith. Holiness in action in each of our vocations and our settings um, so that we are authentic witnesses to the gospel. Then we know that our message is trustworthy and a beautiful invitation. And so these, I pulled a, a couple points there from um, Gaudate de Exutate. The Holy Spirit bestows holiness and abundance among God's holy and faithful people, the parents who raise their children with immense love, and those men and women who work hard to support their families, and the sick, the elderly, religious who never lose their smile. We are called to be holy by living our lives with love and by bearing witness to everything we do wherever we find ourselves. And in the preface, um, it says right near the end, holiness is the crucial word that can be pronounced in presenting a new directory for catechesis. Holiness is the purpose of catechesis and also the catechist way of life. And I thought it was also such a great visual and I think links well with um, Fratelli Tutti is that in um, the directory for catechesis when it makes allusion to um, the apostolic exhortation, Pope Francis invites us, um, he, he, he makes this a very illustrative example that the Beatitudes are like a Christian's identity card. And he says that Jesus simply told us, um, he told us simply what it means to be holy by giving us the Beatitudes. And so I love this vision of when we're going out in the world, our identity card, how people should see us, how they should experience us is, are those Beatitudes. And it's the, the Beatitudes, um, who the word um, happy or blessed becomes a synonym, synonym for holy and it expresses the fact that those faithful to God and his word by their self-giving and gain we gain true happiness. There's very, something very powerful about holding um, the Beatitudes like our identity card. So I think I just pulled the Beatitudes there just to have us all on the same page. Um, of course, in Matthew 5, 1 to 12, um, a beautiful description of us as Christians, what we are called to, what um, Jesus has, sh you know, shared his message with us. And it holds this tension. It is hopeful. It is uh, about holiness. And it is also relational, relational with God and relational with others. Um, and I think Reflecting on this further would, would really be a wonderful spiritual, spiritual exercise um, between our call as catechists and the call from Fratelli Tutti to build social friendship and fraternity. 
And so um, as, a, as a final um, element to raise, uh, Fratelli Tutti, uh, I think we can say too, is a call to realize that we are part of this human community, which has its demands in terms of justice, mercy, and social concern. And our faith propels us to build social friendship and fraternity because we are a hopeful people. We believe that compassion and love for the other is possible. And in return, our faith is strengthened from these demands of justice, compassion, and friendships. So catechists do not only communicate the gospel message, we also need to live it. And that's where holiness comes in. But holiness is not an individual thing. It's also a community aspect. And I've listened to a different online forums on Vertelli Tutti, and we often ask, well, what can I do concretely? And I think it's a, it's a good question, and I'm also um, brainstorming about what we can do concretely. Um, and it's a, so it's an important first question. But in light of what we know through the directory of catechesis, um, being a community of missionary disciples, each with our various gifts, charisms, and vocations, I would like to propose a question for discernment and re reflection. Not just what can I do, but what can we do to also think as a community, how can we respond to the questions um, and, and the call raised in Fratelli Tutti? So what can I do and what can we do? And if we look at our, our communities as um, communities of missionary disciples um, and bring together the different charisms, I think we can really come together and, and find some ways forward. So in a last um, note and in conclusion, um, it's, today was really about making the case that Fratelli Tutti is important for the catechists in light of the new directory for catechesis. So we know that concern for our neighbor is part of the commandment to love God and to love our neighbor. So the catechist is concerned for his or her neighbor. And the catechist as shown in Fratelli Tutti is equipped with hope. And this is a virtue that helps move us forward to build, to bring compassion when everything else seems bleak. The catechist discerns our times, listens to the joys, the struggles, the dreams of the people we encounter today. And the catechist is called to be holy. Our message of faith is only credible if we live this out in our own ways and in our own vocations and how we treat our neighbor. The catechist is called to work in community and help bring an awareness of the various gifts and charisms we have at our disposal and then to respond concretely in our local settings. Thank you very much for following my little response and we look forward to some questions. So I'll invite Mark back on. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we're so grateful uh, that you've helped uh, us to make connections between Fratelli Tutti and the Directory for Catechesis. We knew they were there. Um, <laughs> You've invited us to be hopeful people who respond to the call to holiness by reading the signs of the times and building communities of missionary disciples. I really like the idea of the identity, of the identity card, the Beatitudes, um, the beautiful image from Pope Francis. Thank you providing us, uh, for providing us with these insights, which will help us to live out our Christian vocation as catechists, as people uh, of faith, whether at home or in our parish settings. At this time, uh, we're going to ask, uh, we'll take a few minutes for um, some Q and A and Anne, Dr. Ann Walsh is gonna have a look to see if there's any questions coming in there. And um, uh, Monsignor Kretsch, if you're there, um, uh, we'll have you respond as well. Um, but, but if you're not there, uh, Michelle will take it all. <laughs> Michelle's happy to hear that, I'm sure. Uh -huh. um, Mark, there are a few, couple of questions. There've been uh, there's been a really lively chat going on in the Q and A, and we've been talking back and forth a number of us. But uh, two questions, and they came under Monsignor Kretsch's presentation. Uh -huh. One was about the right of Christian oh. initiation of adults, and it had to do with given the fact that we're in a pandemic. And this reaching out to one another in some ways has become so easy with the virtual means available to us and still 
there's no face to face or very little face to face. How would you suggest we engage in the rite of Christian initiation of adults in this moment? Well, what what you said is true. I mean, uh, most of the parishes that I'm aware of, they're they're doing a lot of their uh, their formation, their catechesis online, Zoom meetings, etc. Um, and so there isn't that personal one-on-one contact, um, at least not what we would expect. I suppose that, you know, that might be the best we can do for now, but perhaps the, uh, the whole period of mystagogy might become more important. Um, you know, so often, and that's one of the difficulties with the RCIA, is that the, the period of mystagogy gets lost. You know, you get them baptized and confirmed and to the Eucharist and then say, okay, you're on your own. Uh, and there is no unpacking of that experience uh, or this, you know, a one evening or one hour unpacking, which really doesn't do justice to the whole journey of faith. And so maybe, uh, especially this year, maybe this is an opportunity. Um, we're hoping, we live in hope, that our churches might be open uh, more, more abundantly, uh, maybe by Easter or after Easter in the spring and throughout the summer, Maybe that's the, 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 the busy time for the catechists to, to work with people, to meet with them and hear their stories and, and, and to share their faith and, and have that kind of personal encounter at that time. Uh, you know, we're, we're limited, let's face it, right now. <laughs> Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it, it's amazing to see how creative some catechists have been with yes. the digital means that are available. And it, even though it's not human face to face, there's certainly something interpersonal there. Yeah. 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 And the best is available. The, Monsignor, the, the other question that's come up in the Q&A is about discerning or choosing between the available online catechetical resources that you mentioned. And uh, this person said, there are so many out there. How do I choose what's good? How do I know what's good? (laughs) That's a good question. Um, I don't have an automatic answer because I've I've not been using a lot of those in in my ministry at the present time. I, I guess what I would do is... I know that there are certain publishing companies, for example, I mean, I do this with books and authors. There are certain publishing companies that I've learned to rely on. Uh, you know, I've read books that are published by a particular company or, or books that are published by a particular author uh, that, you know, I have found to be very balanced. I've found to be very uh, faithful to the teaching of the church. I found to be insightful and encouraging. Um, and so, Certainly for myself, when it comes to printed material, that's what I look for. I think we could do the same when it comes to digital material. Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the suppliers that you can trust that are, that are balanced? Uh, read the reviews, uh, both the negative and the positive, and you should get a sense of, of which, which resources are most helpful. Obviously, uh, we hear by word of mouth as well. I mean, one pastor will say, well, have you, tr- have you seen this series of videos? Or, or uh, you know, a parishioner will say to the priest, well, I saw this really great uh, uh, pod, or I had this, saw this podcast or this video, and it's, it's really, really good. It helped me. Well, check it out and see if it, see if it has a kind of a universal appeal, or is it just appealing to one person's spirituality or one person's piety or, or one person's view of the church, let's say. Monsignor, another question coming up here, perhaps this might be the last one that we would have, um, is that one of the things that we're, uh, we're hearing is this word culture. And uh, this person says that culture is a really rich topic for reflection. Um, is, how common is this conversion to a culture of encounter that Pope Francis speaks of? Um, that The word culture and then uh, Pope Francis' use of the phrase culture of encounter that really challenged us. Are there conversations going on that you're aware of about this? Um, I, not, not directly that I can think of. Uh, when I hear the word culture, uh, as I think you indicated, it's, it's a very rich, rich word. And it's a hard thing to kind of, uh, it's sort of like nailing down jello. Like, what, what is, how do you define it? Uh, the simplest way I look at it, it's 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 how you live. It's the it's the values you live by. It's it's um, you know the the the, uh, the reason that you make the decisions that you make, uh, the way that you act. It's a way of life, and um, 
you know, it's a way of life that identifies you. You know, we say someone that has a certain, uh, well, you know, look at look at diet. <laughs> you know, if you, if you eat a lot of pasta, well, you you you've kind of plugged into the Italian culture. We might say, well, you know, what? How does someone know that we've been plugged into the Christian culture, Christian way of thinking, the Christian way of acting, um, the Christian way of making decisions, and and the, the Christian lens through which we read those signs of the times. I think I that's helpful or not, but <laughs> oh, I think it is, and that's really addressing uh, some of the questions that that really have come up online. Um, a lot of thank yous, and I uh, just want to pass those on to you and to Michelle. Lots of uh, notes of appreciation in the Q and A, and I'm going to turn you back to Marg with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anne and uh, uh, Monsignor Mur uh, Murray. Um, so here we are at the end of the first session, hard to believe, um, and we're looking forward to next session when um, we will have Elisa Lolino, who will um, lead us in a reflection on uh, the Good Samaritan, the passage of the Good Samaritan, and help us to answer that question, who is my neighbor? And then um, Dr. Josephine Lombardi will join us. Um, to help us uh, delve deeper into chapter two of Fratelli Tutti um, and, and hopefully we'll be making the connections. But I think it's going to be a very uh, rich um, session next week as uh, today was. And I thank you all for joining us. Thank you, uh, Monsignor Murray. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Thank you, um, Ann Walsh, uh, we can always count on your support. We appreciate it very much. So thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you next week at one o'clock, same place, same time, and I'll, we'll all be here together. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.